Welcome to the Beyond 3D podcast, where we explore all things 3D and the important role that 3D data plays throughout the manufacturing process, driving decisions throughout a product's life cycle. Here, we talk with industry analysts, business owners, developers, and industry influencers, and hear real stories that you can relate to and learn from, and know which trends and technologies apply to your business. So join us as we go Beyond 3D. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Beyond 3D podcast. My name is Angela Samoz, and today we are here with a, a bit of a celebrity, if you will, Kenneth Wong, who is the Senior Editor for Digital Engineering 24-7. Hi, Kenneth. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not sure I'm a celebrity, but <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, I, you know, I, to get started, we'll we'll eventually ask you to talk about your work for those listeners who may not be familiar but frankly I don't I don't know if anyone is not familiar with your work so um but before we get to that just want to say hello to Jonathan Giroir who is technical evan- evangelist for TechSoft 3D thanks Jonathan for joining us yeah thanks Angela hi everyone hi Kenneth it's great to be here great to Excellent. be with you too so yeah so for maybe the one or two listeners out there that may not be familiar with your work, Kenneth, give us a little bit of your background and then also some of the things that you're writing about these days. Yes. Well, I suppose uh, I work in a very small tight knit community. So most people will likely know the things that I'm, I'm writing. It's only because I've been writing for about like two decades now. So most people probably know my writing if they don't know me personally. Um, when I started writing as a, junior copy editor um, producing news articles based on press releases that I received. At the time, let me see, the biggest news item was that CAT was now available on a personal computer. And that was a big deal at the time. And that was when SolidWorks started doing their first version of SolidWorks release. And I remember the SolidWorks founders coming to our editorial office in San Francisco to give us a demonstration that it was indeed possible to do that on a laptop, a Windows PC laptop. So that was a big deal. And Bill Clinton was a president at the time. And it seems like the world was less conflict prone at the time. Uh, But these days, CAD industry has expanded quite a bit because now if you look at mainstream CAD, many of them actually involve rendering features and simulation features. Those are things that um, at one time when I was when I was a junior editor, those are things that are were not packaged as part of CAD. They were usually separate things that you have to buy either as plug-in or as expensive special features. And simulation at the time was a specialized discipline. You know, um, it's the engineering version of alchemy that only wizard seems able to perform. But today, those are actually part of the CAD packages. So these days, I'm actually not only work, uh, writing about CAD, but also simulation, about uh, machine learning, about self-driving cars, about 3D printing, and about design for additive manufacturing and things like that. Yeah, and certainly within our our space, Kenneth is well known. It's a small community in 3D engineering, but, but certainly well known. Um, it's great to have you here today. And, and today, we can talk about a lot of things, right? But today, we're going to focus in on, on AI and how it's affecting the 3D engineering space, because obviously, that's really been throughout the news, um, both the good and the bad. It's touching a lot of our uh, our life now. ChatGPT came out recently. I'm using it to write copy. People are using it to write speeches for weddings. Um, but what we're interested in is how is how is AI technology now? And it's not even new. I remember back in the early 2000s writing neural networks at university. But particularly right now, how is it a how is it affecting our space or how are you seeing um, AI and, and some of these new tools affecting the 3D engineering space, either building construction, manufacturing, or really the whole product life cycle? I have a feeling that AI sort of started seeping into the design workflow when we have generative design, because it was almost like the first incarnation of AI or AI style design method where you just sort of tell the software your requirements and the software essentially produce 
a geometry or a topology that was suitable for your purposes. So that was, to me, the first incarnation, the first sign that AI was begin beginning to come into the design workflow. Um, but really, right now, um, I'm starting to also see the incorporation of natural languages. So for example, if you use um, Omniverse, now, uh, it used to be that if you want to populate a particular imaginary space, um, you have to pick uh, a uh, items from a library object that is a, a library of objects that is provided for you. You know, if you have like a warehouse, you have typical items that are available in a warehouse that you pick from a library. But in the latest demonstration that I've seen, you could actually type up just a natural language kind of command, type up an issue like you would type something in a Facebook Messenger and says populate this space with typical items that you would see in a warehouse. And then the software is under, um, in, in, intelligent enough to parse that natural language and actually uh, find the objects that is in its own library and started populating it. So that's also another sign that going forward, we will probably have more and more of that kind of feature. And it suggests to me that, you know, the industry up to this point has been building softwares based on menu buttons and uh, menu bars and things that you have to click on and things that you have to pick and choose and numeric inputs and things like that. But we now have an opportunity to actually rethink radically how we allow people to use our software. I mean, I, for one, would prefer to just either talk to my software or type up a typical thing that I'm trying to design and have the software maybe spit out, you know, a a typical a typical engine block as a starting point mm -hmm. or a typical uh, bracket as a starting point. And then let me start it and let me start modifying it by talking more and more to the software about narrowing some spaces or punching more holes and things like that. Up to this point, we are not able to do that. We still have to pick surfaces and uh, pick um, specific uh, hole punching tools or slicing tools or extrusion tools and um, enter uh, parameters uh, manually and things like that. And in a way that makes our tools less accessible because if you don't know the right sequence of order of these um, entries, your design just wouldn't come out or you end up very getting very frustrated. But that way to me, generative design and the introduction of natural language into software we have an opportunity to radically rethink design software uh, UIs. Yeah, so using it kind of as a rough draft. So use that natural language to give us a, a rough draft of the design. And then from there, iterate similar, like if I ask for a rough draft of, a, of an article, I'm gonna have to adjust my the, the text significantly to fit my my needs. So I guess, yeah, from the same, same standpoint, uh, when it comes to doing this in engineering. Uh, you know, one place we're really seeing this, you, you've mentioned generative design uh, a number of times. So that is that's really a, is a paradigm shift, isn't it? From the way we were doing uh, solutions-based engineering to looking more at the problem space and defining the problem, maybe parametrically or algorithmically, and then letting, once we input all of those restrictions, constraints, let us let a system then go and start a, designing a part for us. Where I've seen AI quite helpful already is um, you're trying to minimize or maximize uh, all of your inputs to kind of reach this end result. But the way in which uh, the results are displayed, there can be many, and it can be quite hard to navigate what is most useful or, or then tuning some of those um, those different parameters or those algorithms, those inputs to kind of get to, you know, reduce the, the, the solution set to a set number. And AI has been helpful in doing that as well, kind of coaching people along that process of, of iteration. And again, you, you start with a rough draft, even in this generative design approach, and you, you get something and you, you look at your solutions, you kind of iterate and you, you send it back to the system and it, it comes back. Um, and so AI has been quite helpful in that space. Um, 
But I, I'm curious with the ready-made tools we have right now, uh, have you seen ChatGPT being used in production software or, or soon to be production software? So the features in Omniverse that I've seen where you mm. populate a warehouse by just text messages, it's a feature that was trained on uh, partly on chat GPT and partly on NVIDIA's own um, technology, uh, deep search, I believe, mm -hmm. because the combination of those two are making it possible. Um, Omniverse, of course, is the interactive uh, 3D environment that um, uh, NVIDIA would propose as the ideal place to host digital twins and uh, your simulation cat models and maybe even for AR VR visualization purposes as well. So that's one of the areas where um, I've seen natural language entering the work stream. I've also heard a lot of people who are working to try to inject more natural language driven kind of command. But um, I, I have not seen, I've not seen actually in mainstream CAD packages, for example, I've not seen that um, and at the production level yet, but mm -hmm. I've heard about, and I've been briefed on some research divisions working on doing these things. But it's, but I think we, we should remember that Chat GPT became a big headline, and along with it, things like Mid Journey, uh, the text based image generators, and things like that. They became headline only about one year one and a half year ago. So naturally, if we are going to develop tools based on that, take into account the development cycle, I have a feeling we will not start to see uh, tools, design tools, CAD tools, simulation tools that are powered by these kind of features until maybe the end of this year or the early next year, because we still have to give it time for the developers to test it, do user testing, beta testing, and make sure that um, everyone is comfortable with the the new kind of vocabulary, I guess, the new vocabulary, the new user user interface before it could be rolled out. So um, right now, I think we're just um, in the, um, in the people are secretly working behind the scene, but I haven't seen them publicly much yet. Yeah, no, we're hearing whispers for sure. And a lot of people are trying to think through, all right, how are we going to leverage this new technology? I have seen it successful in a couple places, especially when there's text-based communication um, for like a request for quote, being able to parse that or respond to that, kind of assisting those, um, just the, the, the communication side of, of things and also to kind of prep um, a request or, a, or a, a takeoff engine. So, so that's already being seen. And then one recently, we've been doing some work with a, a pretty exciting company called VizSeq. They've been around for a long time. And again, they, they have algorithms that go and try to do much like Google does a, a textual search. They try to do a, a 3D visual search of, of parts databases. And they, their, their special tools are, um, they've been refining those on looking for for feature, like key feature points in a 3D object. So if I was to even draw one or have a picture of an object, let's say a transfer case, it could go out and search for that or a bracket to go out and search for that. And they've, they've had a long history of doing that. But now as they apply some of the, the, the deep learning approach to doing this visual search, it is, it is accelerating and becoming much more successful and, and having um, positive matches. And they're like, wow, this is, this is a game changer for us. So we are starting starting to see just in, in a couple places um, being able to learn from from past past experience and be able to do that that deep learning um, request for quotes like like if I'm a manufacturing services company where I 3D printing I upload a part or even for subtractive manufacturing and I want a quote on that we can kind of get you a little bit closer because we have a lot of historical information to give you to give you a, a, a quote near near what it, what it should be, or at least a, a good estimate. So we kind of have that, but yeah, I think you're right. Not a lot of people are know quite what to do. They, there's, there's opportunity there and, and end of this year, early next year, um, that would be really exciting to see. We'll, we'll see. Uh, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty aggressive, but I, I'd love to see some, some of the CAD 
vendors out there incorporating this um, fully into their their applications. You mentioned the the um, the 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 user interface changing, so moving from like buttons to um, to a, a text based approach. That's a that's a huge shift as well. Can you talk a bit more about that? I remember how controversial it was when AutoCAD um, announced that they were going to eliminate the, uh, uh, the command box and, <laughs> and turn it all into a window style uh, menu buttons and uh, uh, dialogue boxes. And that was that was a big controversy because human nature is that if you are comfortable doing something a certain way, you resist the idea of radically changing that. So, you know, I have a feeling that there are probably going to be a lot of people who are trained on the menu button systems and the dialogue box systems that might actually resist. On the other hand, uh, the people who have always complained that simulation or CAD is just too complicated to learn and it takes uh, a good two to three months to learn before you become proficient enough to do your first uh, CAD model, they would probably welcome it too. So, you know, I, I, I also foresee some sort of tension to if we have this kind of radical shift in user interfaces. Um, but but I think it's in the long run it's a good thing. In the long run it's a good thing because we already see things like Bing incorporating text-based image generation into its search engine itself. When um, we also see something like Canva, the design software now offers you the ability to actually do simple compositions using text-based. Um, image generation itself. And like you point out, of course, the first result that the computer spit out in response to your request is never going to be your final design. And that shouldn't be because there should be enough room for you as a human expert who knows more about the, whether it's the auto industry or the architecture industry or the nuclear plant industry. You as a veteran of the industry know certain things that the computer wouldn't know. I mean, there are some experts who could simply, you know, uh, look at the curvature of a car from a distance and can tell you reasonably well how the airflow is going to be even without running a airflow test or simulation on it because they've been working on it and they have seen design like this a long time ago and they know what can go wrong and they know what uh, mm -hmm. performs well. So. There should also be room for the human designers to intervene and add his or her own uh, acumen, as his or her own personal knowledge, and and maybe even aesthetic choices. You know, aesthetic choices defines um, what makes a Ford a Ford car, or what makes a uh, Tesla a Tesla, down to the sound that you hear, to the smell inside the in uh, inside the car, to the shape of the car itself. So there should still be enough room. So it's not supposed to be that uh, because suddenly we can just ask AI programs to spit out designs based on requirements, we are going to become, as humans, we are going to become irrelevant. I know that that fear exists in many corners of the industry. To me personally, I don't see that. I have a feeling that it will change the role of human engineers, but it's not going to make human engineers irrelevant. Yeah, that there's a new set of skills needed. It's so interesting. You mentioned like everything that's old is new again. We, we come back to this textual interface or being able to process audio cues. But that that idea of of prompt engineering. So being able to, to properly create a prompt to prompt the system to get the results. We're seeing that all, already, um, but then being able to do that within the context, we still have to talk about extrusions and airflow and tensile strength and and fillets and and be able to um, articulate to some extent what where we want to be so there is there is going to be a redefinition most likely i i feel the roles of, of designers and a new set of skills as they're kind of coached coached along when it comes to um, the new tools that we'll be building so I, I am curious, you, you talked a bit about the metaverse. We also have this idea of digital twins, which can live there. 
Um, do you see other ways that AI is affecting the metaverse or, or the, the building of digital twins? Well, digital twins are not just 3D models, right? Digital twins are um, brought to life, so to speak, by real-time data that is coming from edge devices. If you have a topological or a 3D geometric representation of a wind turbine, that's not necessarily a digital twin. But if you have uh, the exact replica of a wind turbine that is installed somewhere in a particular geographic location, and if there is a steady stream of weather data or uh, the uh, the rust and wear and tear that is collecting on the turbine blade itself and the pressure that the wind turbine is constantly forced to deal with. If you have a steady stream of that kind of real-time data coming into uh, your hub or your database, and then you're able to use these data and actually make the 3D replica somehow much more accurately reflecting the real thing in the field, then you have a digital twin. So in that sense, I think dealing with that amount of, dealing with mountains of data coming in every uh, 15 minutes interval or five minutes interval or hourly interval, that's probably where AI is going to um, have a huge role to play because as human beings, uh, I mean, we are good at making um, decisions based on instinct and based on experiences, but we don't have the ability to crawl through um, thousands of millions of sheets of Excel spreadsheet data and then make the right decision or spot certain patterns based on those uh, based that kind of uh, data set. So in those areas, we have to rely on AI. We have no choice. So in that sense, I think when it comes to data management and uh, pattern recognitions and as a consequence of pattern recognition, then making predictions about possible failure or um, maintenance that is probably required, uh, preventative maintenance that is recommended, or um, certain things that you need to do uh, before the to strengthen the real thing in the field to be able to withstand um, a weather phenomenon that is developing something somewhere. Those things are all where I think AI will have a huge role to play. Yeah, and in uncovering those maybe those hidden patterns that, that aren't readily apparent to the eye. Yeah, yeah, so for preventative maintenance, that certainly can, can be quite, quite impactful. How about in this, this space of um, simulation? And we see that really touching all aspects of the design processes more and more earlier on in the design pra uh, process. Do you see that also being affected? by these new tools? I definitely see, I definitely think that uh, simulation is where we will likely see a lot of AI-driven features. Aside from the natural language, simulation is also where there is a lot of simulation results that people have to review mm -hmm. in order to make the right decision about how to revise the design. And also, this is also where um, some people are experimenting with what is generally called reduced order models. So the standard approach is in simulation, you run a physics-based simulation to figure out what will happen to every little corner, every little surface, and how they will deform. But if you have the ability to actually look at a lot of these results that have been run in the past and figure out the correlations between certain input parameters and certain these uh, results that are results that are significant then you have the ability to run simpler models simpler models that are driven by ai and not really driven by full physics run so that as a consequence means that you will be able to run simulation a lot faster. Um, it would, and that's one area where leading developers like Ansys, for example, have publicly talked about efforts that they are already working on. So that's another area uh, where simulation, where we can expect that it will probably become faster. And of course, the natural language, if we can incorporate it into the UI, definitely um, it will make 
it will make simulation less like alchemy and more like a, a simple tool that uh, general engineers can easily learn and use. Yeah, well, that's exciting. Trying to open up these these more complicated tools to the general masses that instead of the, the specialists, that, that is exciting. You know, um, our audience here are software developers, um, development managers, uh, trying to figure out what to do with their software. And it, it is it is early days, but do you have any asks right now of the, the industry? So this is your opportunity to kind of voice your grievances as to like what we need to do or where we should go or what we've done that's already uh, painful. It's not really a grievance, but I foresee a problem because mm. we're talking about metaverse in singular, but more likely I'm seeing that it is going to be metaverses, plural, and more metaverses than we would like to handle probably because, I mean, for example, you know, uh, BMW has a digital twin of its uh, car factory in Omniverse. Ericsson, the phone company, has some digital twins of real live cities in their own Omniverse pockets of the Omniverse where they are testing out uh, 5G coverage and things like that. Can you actually take that uh, car that is coming out of the digital twin model on BMW and try to drive it through uh, a real life digital twin city that Ericsson built? Right now, I don't think that's possible. And that has to do with the fact that each digital twin is constructed with its own sets of uh, uh, requirements, with its own sets of data that is powering it, and maybe even really with its own set of complicated assembly of file formats and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the interoper interoperability between digital twins is an important issue that I, I, I don't see how it's going to be resolved if we have a situation where each manufacturer is creating its own little pockets isolated pockets, really, where they are running simulation of their uh, digital twins. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you are a single company that have different digital twins of your machines in different pockets, I'm not even so sure that they, these twins themselves, belonging to a single company is going to be interoperable. So if we believe that digital twins are going to be our future, I think it's very important to figure out a way in which digital twins in one space could go into another space so that we don't have to rebuild these twins again and again, even though it already exists in another person's metaphors. So that will be an important thing. And that's something that is worth, um, that's a challenge that is worth tackling for the sake of our industry together, I think. That is, that is interesting because here at Techsoft, we are the interoperable specialists but we we focus on single files and assemblies not not connecting metaverses together with with all the additional information so so we're listening so thanks for thanks for that and thanks for that that plug a little bit too for techsoft um i i have one that's come up recently um i do work within the marketing team and at techsoft and uh, there seems to be a lot of um a lot of confusion when it comes to how we're labeling and marketing different products. So AI becomes this blanket to, all right, well, what exactly are you doing under the hood? Everybody's applying AI to uh, what they're, what they're doing, but there's, there's a difference between neural networks and machine learning and deep learning and generative design. So making sure that we're true to exactly what we're doing under the hood and, and what, what the underlying technology is there and making sure that we we all agree on a certain set of terms and definitions so that as we talk about a technology and, and what it is, we can be very clear about what it can do, what it can't do, and then also some of what when it can't, when it does fail and fall down, making sure we have those those safeguards and those understand that understanding about really where, where it's coming from and, and its abilities. So that's that's an ask I have and and also signing up to to fulfill as well as. Uh, here at TechSoft 3D, making sure that we we do our very best uh, to do that, and and probably for uh, for uh, for your company and and your writing too. Make sure that we we're really on the same page and we have these definitions um, properly defined and use them. It, it's it's good to challenge these terms once in a while, because I remember at one point uh, 
the term PLM became so um, so overused that essentially anything from an Excel spreadsheet to a complicated enterprise software falls into product like cycle management, PLM. And AI, as it becomes the catchphrase and the popular terminology, uh, the popular lingo that everyone is trying to use, um, it it has it faces the same risk that the term PLM once did. So I think it's in our interest to make sure that when we say AI, we mean AI and it's not some kind of programmatic trickery that simply do something that it's based on automation you know mm-hmm. it has to have some sort of self-learning ability and it has to have some kind of features that um, resembles decision making um, without human intervention got it yeah yeah great how about what are you really excited about looking forward the next couple of years what what excites you the most about this industry and what we're talking about today I think this industry has a lot of growth. This industry is growing despite the conflict-prone days that we are facing today. Um, The Middle East, as we speak right now, is embroiled in a new conflict. And uh, in Europe, you know, flames of war is uh, spreading and uh, people are trying to contain it. People smarter than me, I hope, are able to do that. But even under those difficult circumstances, even when the economy is always tipping on the edge of jeopardy, we are still able to come up with things like digital twins and things like generative design and things like design for additive manufacturing. And they are advancing. So, if only we live in a much more um, harmonious and peaceful kind of world, uh, we can accomplish much more. If only if supply chains are less prone to be interrupted because of regional conflicts, we can accomplish much more. I, I, I really hope that, uh, uh, I really, I'm an idealist. I hope that we can look forward to the kind of world where I, we can serve the community much better without having to worry about other things like conflicts. Absolutely. I I agree completely. Well, thank you, uh, Kenneth. Where can people find you and learn more about your writing and your work? Uh, yes. Um, I regularly write feature articles for digital uh, digital engineering 24-7. It's DE 24-7. So um, you can search for it on Google and uh, I'll be there and my writings will be there for sure. Excellent. Well, this has been really fun. Thank you so much for your conversation today. Fun for me too. Thank you very much for having me as a guest. Thank you both. And I think, Kenneth, don't you also have a podcast with DE247 that you uh, host? And I know you post videos quite often as well. So we can put some links to those. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent. And thank you to all of our listeners out there who joined us for another episode of Beyond 3D. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you did, please share it with some colleagues and others, uh, you know, um, uh, folks in your network uh, so we can share this conversation and and challenge each other to 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 grow and, and help this this uh, uh, industry evolve. Um, please give us a like, uh, leave us a review on either iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast. It will help more folks in the industry discover the conversation and take part. Um, and we, we appreciate your support. So. Until next time, we'll enjoy your day. Thank you for joining us on the Beyond 3D podcast hosted by TechSoft 3D. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and leave us a review or subscribe on SoundCloud. To listen to past episodes or learn more about TechSoft 3D, visit www.techsoft3d.com forward slash blog. Send us comments and suggestions at info at techsoft3d.com. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you'll join us again on the next episode of Beyond 3D.